6, 22 to 59. And if you've got your Bibles or whatever you use, uh, you'd like to follow it. I'm reading it from the NLT, which will probably be slightly different than what you may have. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realised Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread, and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats, and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, We want to perform God's work too. What should we do? Jesus told them, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. Then the people began to murmur in disagreement because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? But Jesus replied, Stop complaining about what I said, for no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me, and at the last day I will raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I who were sent from God, have seen him. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread which I will offer so the world, will may, li world may live is my flesh. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? they asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life with you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me. In the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. Amen. I don't know about you, but I believe that this is the basis, really the basis of our belief. And we build on this, and in the taking of communion, which we will do a little bit later on. What I would like to do is go through those verses a little bit more. But before doing that, 
I want us to understand the use of and the meaning of the word bread. Bread has often been referred to as the staff of life. Bread being what it is, is a main food source and staff being the support of life. There are several references to bread in the word, in fact over 200 times. Whenever any guest or visitor arrived, the instruction by the head of the household to the wife was go and make bread to feed the guests. This was the general custom whenever visitors arrived. It was always take the best flour and make bread for our guests. When these special meals were prepared, it was very often served with a glass of wine as well. And this was first mentioned when Melchizedek entertained Abram. Genesis 14, 18. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem and the priest of God Most High, brought Abram some bread and wine. Now we all know who Melchizedek was. He was the God-appointed person of the time. In fact, some theologians even believe he was the precursor to Jesus. So we know that it was somewhat very high. And also we know that Abram, prior to being called Abraham, paid tithe to him from all the victories that he'd got and he gave him a tenth. So those are sort of clues as to who Melchizedek was. It was when Abraham entertained angels who brought him a message from the Lord. That's Genesis 18 verse 6. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, hurry, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough and bake some bread. So again, that shows the importance of using the best flour to make bread for visitors. And certainly when you're entertaining angels, that's the first thing you must do, <laughs> is feed them basically. <laughs> so bread was very, very important in the life of all previous generations to Jesus. And subsequently, of course, becomes important through taking of communion. Bread was considered the main life sustainer and today still is, is that bread is the prime ingredient. And we all know that in the Ukraine there's been this huge problem because they are the grain suppliers virtually to the world and they were unable to ship because of the war. And so world countries were being deprived of flour to make bread. But the thing is, I think we have to realise that these references are also spiritual as both the meetings with Melchizedek and of Abraham with the angels were of a spiritual nature. So let us look again at the passage in more detail. You see that the main memory people of the time had was of being fed by bread from heaven, manna, as their forefathers journeyed through the desert for 40 years, which is referenced in Exodus 16.4 and also in Psalm 78 verse 24. But the point that the people here fail to realise is that the bread was God provided. They only thought of the physical aspect, not the spiritual one. In verse 32, Jesus starts to explain the source of the bread and what the bread really represents. Jesus tells them that he is the true bread from heaven, that God has sent into the world to give life to the world. Now all of those who have accepted Jesus understand that. But you can understand the people of his age and era probably didn't quite really grasp it. And this is why he said, you only follow me because I feed you. And they're totally missing that he is feeding them spiritually and he's building them up. And he wants them to recognise that he is actually bread from heaven. So verses 35 to 40 the word here is a reference to I am. Whose name is I am? God. God. So Jesus is placing himself at the same level of God, or is God, the Holy Trinity being three in one. Jesus is I am. God is I am. So you have God and Jesus as one. And then, of course, later on we have the Holy Spirit. No one who comes to me. This is referring to the spiritual aspect, not the physical. 
So it isn't a case of them going down and bowing before Jesus. It's a case of them going before Jesus and accepting him for who he really is. So it's different. It isn't a case of a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. And we always reckon that when people give their life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit is working in both people. Both the people who is looking, who are looking, and the person who is there to help them on that journey. So again, it's spiritual aspect. The Holy Spirit is at work in both parties. Verse 36. Again, Jesus refers to the unbelief of the people. Like today, the people of the time were and are blinded to the fact of who Jesus was and is. And that's the ploy of the enemy. But as from last week, we remember that God actually blinded his people so that they would not see. Verse 37. This brings to the fore the fact that God has already chosen and knows those who will be saved. Matthew Henry says that these verses state in a few words two of the most important teachings in the Bible. The first is that God has given certain ones to Christ and that all those whom he has given will be saved. The other is our own responsibility. To be saved, a man must come to the Lord Jesus and accept him by faith, is the spiritual side. God does choose some people to be saved, but the Bible never teaches that he chooses some to be damned. That's an interesting one, isn't it? It is God's desire that all should be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. If anyone is saved, it is because of the free grace of God. But if anyone perishes forever, it is their own fault, because they have not chosen to accept the Lord for who he is. Choice. We all have choice. And one thing that God doesn't take away is that right, our free will to make our own choice. So what we must do when we become born again is give that free will. We must choose to give it back to God. Not easy, but that's what is required really. In verse 48, Jesus again reiterates, I am the bread of life. He goes on to say in verse 51, anyone who eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, offered so that the world will live. In verse 52, still the people fail to understand the true meaning of what Jesus was saying. You may have heard from time to time that people have referred to Christians as cannibals because they eat the flesh of Jesus and drink his blood. And this is how you can see we're having to say that because Jesus said, you must eat of my flesh. But of course, it's not physical flesh. It's the bread. And it's drink the wine, which represents both of us. It's body and his blood. Verse 53 to 58 explains in greater detail the meaning and purpose of Jesus' life and his eventual death upon the cross. This then brings us on to the Last Supper and the communion we have just received or about to receive. What Jesus was doing at the Last Supper was fulfilling all that he had been teaching in these verses. But once again, even the disciples did not truly understand what was happening. Even though they were with Jesus, walking with him all that time, seeing him, hearing him, and when, even when he explained in great detail, he still failed, in some cases, to understand. And we see this same thing today, is that people fail to understand the word of God and what it means. And so we have to have it explained to us, don't we? They thought that this Last Supper was in memory of the Passover. What was happening was fulfilment of Jesus' life purpose. The whole of his life was leading up to this Last Supper and then his ultimate crucifixion upon the cross. But they failed to see this, they failed to understand and all the messages that Jesus had given through his life to his disciples, only a few actually really understood. The instruction that Jesus gave to his disciples and to us who, to, who believe was to eat this bread, Jesus, and feed on him until his return. And that's another thing, is that we eat this until he comes again, the promise that he will return. 
when of course we won't need to do it because we will be in his presence we will be with him hallelujah mm -hmm. so when we have communion we need to understand four facts one we are remembering what Jesus did for us two we are receiving the bread of life three we are obeying his instruction to have communion in remembrance of him until his return fourthly we are celebrating the fact that he will return hallelujah mm -hmm.